everyone. I'm Tyler Mace Childers, a product marketing manager for Azure Synapse, and I'm thrilled to welcome you all to our second Ask the Expert session for Azure Synapse Influencers. Uh, this is an exciting event for us in this event series. Uh, it lets us connect with all of you, our network of Synapse influencers, um, and in these sessions, we'll share helpful tips, tricks, and updates from our Synapse product experts, and we'll answer your questions live and also via chat. First off, I want to take a quick moment to thank you all for your engagement in the Influencer Program over the last few weeks. Uh, since we've launched, uh, whether you've been sharing others' content or creating your own, uh, don't forget to keep using the hashtag Synapse Influencers and Azure Synapse to make it easy for others to find your Synapse-related posts. Uh, your ongoing efforts really help your peers and other data professionals, maybe even someone in this very audience, to overcome challenges and build amazing Synapse solutions. Uh, it's been just eight weeks since we launched the program, and it's already far exceeded our expectations. We are up to this morning 575, which is amazing. Um, whether you're a challenger, contender, or champion, we really appreciate your commitment to this community. As a reminder, this event is intended for our Synapse influencers, so if you somehow got past our bouncers at the door <laughs> and they haven't signed up yet for the program, please do at aka.ms slash Synapse Influencers. Now, I would like to um, go through just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first, ask your questions with the Q&A function in Teams. Uh, many of you also submitted questions when you registered, and we'll do our best to answer everything we can in the hour we have today. Uh, some questions we'll, put out, uh, we'll pull out to answer live, and other questions we'll answer in the chat. Uh, do try to stay on topic, of course. Uh, this is about Spark and Synapse. Um, if you ask questions that are not about today's topic, we'll we can try to answer them, um, but we'll also likely save them for a future Ask the Experts session. Your team's name is shown when we answer your question in chat, and we'll try to give you a shout out if we answer your question live, or you can ask your questions anonymously if you'd prefer. We are recording the session, FYI, uh, in case uh, <laughs> we wanna use it uh, later on, and stay tuned for details also uh, on our next session, which is coming up in just two weeks. Now I'm pleased to welcome our experts today, uh, all the way from the UK, Mr. Simon Whiteley, Director of Engineering at Advancing Analytics and uh, an MVP, and more importantly, a champion, <laughs> Synapse Influencer. Uh, Martin Lee from our Azure Synapse Spark team. Uh, Marcus Weimer uh, is an engineering manager with our Synapse ML team. And Daniel Colo is a program manager also with the Spark team. Hi, everybody. We also have a couple chat moderators helping us out, members of our Synapse community team here, uh, so we'll get to as many of your questions as we can. Without further ado, I'm going to kick off a Q&A with kind of a softball question, <laughs> but uh, welcoming Simon. Hi, Simon. I um, want to just start off by saying what excites you about Spark and Spark 3.2 launching with Synapse? All right. Hello. Uh, yeah, no, loads, loads of things. Uh, in fact, what, is, what excites me about Spark is a, is a dangerous question just because I'm fairly well known to be a bit of a Spark fanboy. This is how I spend my time nerding out about what's gone on in the Spark community. Um, but 3.2 was a bit of a biggie. 3.2 had a load of things go in there which are, they've either kind of been in the works for a while or they've been things that you could kind of like turn on in the deep and dirty background. And I just saw a lot of things just actually get more mainstream. So there's three things I always pick out if people are asking questions of it. Um, the Pandas API is one. So, I mean, bringing people on and allowing people to talk a common language is so important. And, you know, out in the world of Python, not Spark, Pandas is just like the common language of how people actually interact with data when they're writing Python. Now, for a while, we had a thing called koalas. And so there's this whole koalas thing, which looked like pandas and felt like pandas and had fairly good feature parity, but you had to import pandas, not koalas. Um, and it had pretty good adoption. But from 3.2, you've got pandas actually baked into it. So you can just use pandas as PD, and it's the Spark engine, and it's using Spark, and it distributes. There's all the good stuff, but it's just pandas. Fantastic. That's one. Two is a thing called AQE, which I've waffled about a ton. It's got adaptive query execution. Essentially, it's just making the query engine better. So it starts off with a plan. It then looks at the plan and goes, is this still the right plan? Oh no, there's way more data than I thought. And it changes the plan. 
Now, in the grand scheme of other database engines, that's not shocking, but for Spark, that is a major thing because you don't necessarily have statistics up to date when you've got a separation of storage and compute. So allowing it to query things that often work through that, it's just a massive speed boost. You find people just querying things better, opening up for analytics. Final thing, and then I'll stop talking at you, is ANSI mode of SQL. Now again, tons and tons of people have jumped on uh, because Spark is now a bit more mainstream, because you can be writing T-SQL in serverless synapse pools, and then open up Spark and have a bit of a go, and you go, oh, Oh, it's it's not quite the same. It's it's lost a load of syntax. Um, ANSI mode means we have all the things that you expect that are in that common ANSI standard of SQL. Doing things like working out the difference between dates was a very awkward thing in prior Spark. It had like months between, not like date diff. And so you had to have these weird esoteric things. Just ANSI standard just means it's a lot more common. And therefore, again, that same bringing people on, allowing people to speak the same language and just using this tool to get the most out of it. And a load of other stuff. So yeah, 3.2 is fairly huge. Uh, and so yeah, no, it's great to see it actually in Synapse. Thanks, Simon. I heard something about adopting pandas, which got me somewhere else. <laughs> but anyway, um, we had a question come in um, about how does Synapse handle Delta table natively at the Spark kernel level? Um, Simon, do you want to take that or any yeah. of our other students? Hey, yeah. I, can, I can at least start and then the guys can chip in and correct me should I butcher the answer. <laughs> no um, worries. So, I mean, the answer is, so Delta is just a way of reading and writing data. Once it's inside Spark, it's no different to any other data frame. So it, all it is is a simple, it's an open source library that allows it to understand the Delta format. So the same as if you read some Parquet or read JDBC or read data coming from anywhere, as soon as it's inside the Spark engine and actually being processed by the actual Spark executors, it's the same. There's no difference. It's just, it's just data. So the Delta implementation is purely a Delta reader and a data writer and the efficiencies about how it actually decides what data it reads and writes. Uh, it doesn't do anything special in the kernel. It's, it's just a way of reading and writing. Unless I'm entirely wrong. Go. <laughs> <laughs> no. Daniel is nodding. I do want to he head over to Daniel because I hear he has some news to break for us. Daniel, take it away. You are on mute, Daniel. <laughs> I am muted, of course. Uh, no, I'm not. So, time and uh, touched on, touched base on that or kind of already. Uh, but we had a Spark 3.2 uh, as a preview at preview stage on Azure Synapse for uh, roughly a couple months. Uh, and as of this Monday, we're officially GAing uh, the Spark 3.2 engine. So all the all the goodies that kind of someone talked about about AQE uh, and pandas and uh, like if you look at the release notes you're gonna see like dozens and dozens of improvements. Uh, but one thing that uh, we are also releasing with the new runtime is that we're releasing it with an updated Delta Lake library. So Delta Lake 1.2, which is the latest Delta Lake available, uh, is present uh, within the the Spark 3.2 runtime. So that's exciting news, actually. So throughout this week, you're going to see announcements and some blog posts kind of coming through on, on Twitter and on tech community, uh, talking a, a little bit more in depth about all those things. Uh, but it is officially GA. If you go into the Azure Synapse Analytics uh, portal or studio, you can create uh, fully supported uh, Spark 3.2 uh, Spark pools. Can I dive in for a second with why that's really exciting on a Delta 1.2? <laughs> of course. Always good to geek Because again, I'm just far too excited by all of it. <laughs> um, but yeah, Delta Delta 1.2. Um, I mean, it's again, it's an open source project. There's loads, there's a whole roadmap. You can go on there and have a look at what was included in 1.1, 1 1.2, all of that. Um, but 1.2 particularly brought a few things. Um, data skipping based on the transaction log and the statistics gathered in it. So when you write a file down in the transaction log, you'll see the statistics actually go. So it captures the minimum and max maximum value for the first 32 columns. And then that's used in terms of speeding a query. So it doesn't even have to open the parquet and work out whether or not you should read it. 
it's just huge performance things baked into there as well as file compaction and optimizing all of that kind of stuff and there's one massive one which is huge for me as part of a actual BAU using this in anger as a real professional system um, which is a restore so being able to say based on time travel oh, oh actually the load last night it completely ruined my table I did a merge on the wrong key all of our data is now garbage um, whereas previously we could uh, do a time travel and we can have a look what the data used to look like the simple act that we can now restore it to a previous version of that delta table using time travel and transaction log it's just a method to switch it's just a massive thing for the day-to-day -day running of it and using it as an actual profession system. So yeah, 1.2 is great. Loads of things in there. And the fact that I didn't know until, what, 10 minutes before this call, uh, the Delta 1.2 was in there. And that's that's great. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, Tim has asked us a question here. Is there a guide or a best practice on how to decide on the cluster sizings based on data volume or uh, operations? um toss it out there uh anybody you want to talk through that or um even simon you want to show anything to do with that you might be on mute simon uh, i think i had my arm in front of the microphone is that all right <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, oh God, it's the age old question with how do I size my Spark cluster? Um, and generally it's it's tricky. Um, most of the time it's the answer of try it, test it, have a look at the stats afterwards and then actually adjust it to what matters. And people hate that answer because people are used to the fairly on prem idea of growth planning and capacity management planning and having an idea of how big it needs to be before you run a query. And honestly, most of the time you don't know until you try and run something. Um, there's some general guidance. I mean, so generally we try and talk personally. My recommendation, not official, um, is all about I tend to go for smaller workers if I can. Now, actually, that's kind of inefficient. Um, let me like, let's go to whiteboard mode if that's all right. Yeah. Uh, do some drawing. You guys let me know if you can see that all right. Yeah, whiteboard? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I've got my Spark cluster and I'm sitting around with a Spark cluster and I've got two little workers. They're quite happy. And then I've got some data sitting in the lake and my data is already stored in some form of chunks. Now, the fact that we're working with the data lake is based on HDFS. Therefore, even if you've got one giant file, it still does chunks. It still, it still turns it into file extents. Everything is about parallelism in the world of Spark. Now, if I've got two small workers, I can get Essentially, each one of these gets two chunks of data on there. And then if I run a query that needs to combine the data, I end up with data shuffle and it ends up kind of crossing the data, moving things around. And in all parallel systems, data movement tends to be the thing that's right. Now, I could just actually make one bigger worker and throw it all the same, but then I don't really get any parallelism. You know, and it's all the questions are around going really, really big with these. Maybe actually I want four workers, five workers, 10 workers. That's the joy of Spark. It's all about having a scalable number of workers that you're spreading the work across. That comes to if I have a small, if I have a, a small number of very large workers, each time I scale up, I'm paying quite a big price to add that extra worker. So as a preference, I tend to go with smaller workers and then as many of them as I need to fit the data into memory. That's the question. So how, how, how can I fit the data into memory? If this is, what, kind of 10 gig of data down there, if I want to parallel all of that data in parallel at once, I need at least 10 gig of memory across my focus. Now, people look at it and they go, okay, well, that, that VM's got 14 gig of memory. I can fit it all on that one VM, right? And it's, no, not quite, because there's an overhead for running Spark, and running the JVM. The, essentially, you don't get all of that 14 gig because there's an operating system. Right? And usually that's between, oh, I can't remember what the Synapse one is off the top of my head. Normally it's between five and seven gig overhead per worker of actually sort of keeping that running. And then, so say if we said there's 14 gig per worker and we take away seven gig of that to run Spark, so we're left with roughly seven gig per worker of how much memory we can actually fit, how much data we can fit in memory at once. But 
Spark then has a, a, an allocation that it uses for storage versus caching. So there's a percentage of that that goes, actually, you don't have all of that. Maybe we reserve 50% of it for caching. Which of my workers can now get 3.5 gig of data on it? So if you say, well, how much data have I got? With the smallest number of workers, you need as many workers as you can fit that amount of data across that with that limit. And I know that's a lot. That's like, uh, what, how many do I need? What? It doesn't have to all fit in memory at once. You can process chunks of it. It can actually sort of scan things through and be working through it. It's all about, you need it to run all in parallel. How fast does it need to go? And then you get into certain scenarios where if you're trying to say, trying to group on something that's awkward and it has to pull all the data together, you try and sort by something gnarly, you try and repartition it because you want to do fine control your data and you jam it down to something that single threads it, then occasionally your data is too big to fit on a single worker and you get out of memory exceptions and it does. And if that's the case, you come across that when you're querying it, when users try and use it, then you can up the workers, reduce the number of them, and then you've got a little bit more breathing space on each worker. That's a very, very nutshell, garbled, lots of things to think about answer. But they're the kind of things that we take people through. How much data have you got? What kind of queries are you running on it? How fast does it need to run? How much is it going to fit into memory at once? Tends to be the kind of thing. Make any sense? <laughs> <laughs> Assuming it makes more sense to the people in this audience. <laughs> And it does to lovely me, but thank you, Dustin. Uh, and Dustin's gonna put, uh, we got a question from Dustin, um, and he says, it seems that Synapse Spark is a fork of open source. Is there a way to see the source or at least more visibility into which Spark options are supported? We can still see your whiteboard. Sign yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. Um, you want me to take that one? Sure, go ahead, Martin. All right, so um, Synapse Spark is not necessarily a fork of uh, the open source Spark. We actually are supporting open source Spark, so it really is uh, no different from open source Spark. All the options and the documentation that you see in open source are um, basically what you could find. Uh, I, we, we are working on some improvements in our documentation as well to kind of assist. The, some of the differences that we have in our code uh, of or our version of Spark, I want to say, is that we just added some internal libraries that kind of simplifies some of the uh, the hookups underneath the covers, right? So uh, connecting between different sources using AAD pass through um, to connect to, uh, you know, kind of single sign on type of thing. Um, we have all those libraries internally that we've added to uh, our uh, solution uh, to kind of just make things a little more seamless. But Spark itself is the same as open source. So um, the only differences that you might have to look up is to just make sure the Spark version you're looking for is um, uh, you're looking at the correct documentation right, for all the different versions of Spark. And like, like we said, we just uh, we just released 3.2, so you could look at the documentation for that to see what are all the options that are available. Thanks, Martin. Okay. We have a question that was submitted uh, when someone signed up here. How does Delta table management work in Synapse for CDC processes? Simon, you want to take that one? Yeah, 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 I do. Right, let me, this is definitely a whiteboard uh, answer. Um, yeah, there's, there's two, there's two, the problem of it being kind of a, a pre-submitted is there's two ways of interpreting that is to do with it, either as CDC in terms of the, the Delta change feed functionality, which is on the roadmap, um, but actually just saying CDC, changed data. How do I deal with, I'm, I'm ingesting from a source and my data's changing, how do I manage my Delta tables? Um, and let's just say a quick bit of guidance about the various things we need to do on the Delta tables, the ways we've got applying those changes and what we can do currently in terms of Synapse. So we've got a database. Oh, it's purple. Okay, cool. Purple is our source database. Why not? Uh, and we ingest that into some kind of, let's go with Ali and let's call that a bronze layer. So we're ingesting that into a table. And for that, yeah, I'd absolutely put it into a Delta table, but I'd do that as a pend only. So we, whether we're getting it as changes, so literally saying I'm an update, I'm an insert, I'm a delete, or we just get here's all the records that have changed, append that directly in. So that is very much an append only. 
we're just adding them all in. So you can have duplicates. You're going to have a whole mix of things in there. Um, in terms of how we need to manage that, then, I mean, so it's not we're not actually going to be going and updating any records. We're not going to have any any issues around that. Uh, we need to think about how often we archive the data, and if we're archiving, we might want to do partitioning. Whoops, partition. That that says partitioning. Sure. Um, how often we do partitioning, and kind of we're probably going to be partitioning on some kind of date range. So it's we can do kind of almost partition switching. Just delete that part. Get rid of that partition as it ages out. And there's not that much else we need to do and worry about that. Um, when we move on to the latest phase and we go, well, actually, I don't want just a giant pile of appends. I want to actually apply those changes. Now, because we're using Delta, we can do a merge. We can actually say, well, I want to merge that data in based on a key that, that says merge, believe me, um, and actually have those changes applied. Now, that means there's records that were previously loaded that we're going to be overwriting. We're doing updates. And Delta is great because it can it can handle that, it can handle updates, but you end up getting a little bit of a mix of things being overwritten, there's a redundancy, you get obsolete files because of how Delta works. So at that point, we need to be thinking about doing vacuuming, cleaning up your history tables. We need to be thinking about doing optimizing or compaction. You wouldn't probably want to do optimizing on your appends as well, depending on whether or not how small your various different changes are. So you're kind of bringing these things in through there, you're cleaning up, you're kind of managing the table as you go. Again, you might in that kind of silver layer uh, get into the realms of I'm trying to do some performance, start trying to organize where your data is looking at the statistics gathered on the table because people might be going in and querying it. Certainly when you get over into any kind of gold table, any kind of real business facing data, data that we actually, people are going to be querying in anger and trying to use as a full lake house, maybe querying via can have serverless, exposing to Power BI, whatever they're doing, then yeah, we might be merging again. Might be looking after the change records, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we might be doing, uh, you've got replace where. Now replace where is a way of essentially doing partition swap. So actually, I'm going to get a whole new values for this month. Get rid of the one there. Here's the new value for that month and you can manage it that way. There's different kind of things that people from the warehousing perspective, this is all fine. This is all stuff we do day in, day out. And those same ideas of vacuuming, optimizing, partitioning, they're all going to apply. So kind of as you get further through the curation, as it gets closer to the business, you end up doing slightly more delta table management because you're truly really starting to care more about performance and optimizing and statistics and getting it into the right shape so that can, people can really, really kind of get the performance that they're after. Um, in the current state of delta from one point. Thanks, Amy. Tim is asking, would you recommend using the time travel feature of the Delta format as a replacement for SCD2 historization of the data, or is it better used for auditing or reapplying certain data stages in case of downstream errors and historize the data table additionally to make it queryable for other systems? For example, serverless pool, which doesn't support time travel yet, question mark. To me. <laughs> <laughs> you or yeah. Daniel want to answer that or? Go ahead, Simon. <laughs> uh, very strongly, no. Never use it for SCD type 2 unless you hate money and want to give all of your money away. That's kind of my default answer. Um, kind of comes down to how Delta works. Essentially, when we go and kind of, if we've got Got a delta table. We have our, let's call it sales. Got our delta log sitting in there. And we have two big chunky parquet files in there. And that's got loads of files. Let's say there's 10 million rows in each of those files. And if we come in and we do an update and go, I want to change one record, please. And there's just a single record that happens to be in one of those files being updated. That's going to come in. It's going to go, well, actually, ooh, that's one of these records is no longer valid. There's a record in there that's being changed by the uh, by this transaction. Now, the way Parquet works, Parquet is immutable. You cannot change a Parquet file. Therefore, what it does, it goes and writes a brand new version of all 10 million rows and then says, we no longer bother reading this original. That's how it works. So actually, in making that small change, you're copying 
9,999,999 rows that didn't change over into your new copy of the data. That is massively redundant. There's a huge amount of excess copy that's going over. But each time you change it, every time there's a small change, especially we're doing things like streaming, there's just this massive overhead of each snapshot version that you're using for time travel is likely to have a load of copies of rows that haven't changed, but it have to be copied over because of the nature of how Delta works. Now there's ways of getting around it with low shuffle mergers and things that made it slightly more efficient, but you still get this. This is still how Delta works. So if you think over the kind of time period that we want to do slightly changing dimensions over, if we're talking months, years, we're talking years and years and years of business history, we want to be able to query, think about how much redundant data you're going to have built up over that time if you're relying on time travel to do that. It's just, it's just not something that we do. But realistically, the way we have in our head for what is Delta time travel for, it's a backup. Think of it more like a transactional backup from a SQL server. It's a, oh, we did something wrong. We need to go back to seven days ago, maybe 30 days ago to have those different versions. It's a system restore points you can get back to for your table. It's not a slowly changing dimension. You can use it as that. Absolutely you can, but your storage costs are going to be really high. You're just going to keep a load of redundant excess data that you don't need to keep. Generally better just to manage it and build it as a, as a straight logical process, the same we would with any other SQL SCD. And feel free to disagree. <laughs> um, Daniel, I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, <laughs> uh, David asks, uh, can we, uh, uh, basically a source control question about CICD. Um, source control is pretty critical to solution developers. The CICD and Synapse is not able to be automated like in ADF. We have to manually tend to the maintenance of a published branch. This approach was already changed, improved and automated in ADF with help of an NPM package. When will a similar change come to Synapse as well? <laughs> Daniel, you're on mute. I'm, I'm actually going to push that to, to Martin. Oh, OK. Martin, go ahead. I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. I was actually responding. Uh, no worries. Um, it's a CICD question, and maybe um, okay. this is maybe off topic, and we can save it for another session. But source control is critical to solution developers. CICD and Synapse is not able to be automated like an ADF. We have to manually tend to the maintenance of a published branch. This approach was already changed in ADF with the help of an NPM package. When will a similar change come to Synapse as well? Yeah, so I, I can't go into a lot of details here, but uh, we are working on some substantial improvements in our product and uh, CICD is one of the, the features we are working on. Uh, so there will be there will be improvements, uh, I think, uh, uh, coming soon, <laughs> but I can't really go into details yet. And then Dustin, ask another question. Is there any guidance around running Spark structured streaming jobs that will run continuously? Do they need to be terminated every so often to get a fresh Spark pool? Daniel, you want to take that one? Sure. So uh, we have, uh, so the scenario that he described uh, has been uh, pinpointed and is a continuous feedback that we're getting out of the product. So uh, we have, we are uh, making changes to the engine to support kind of longer running or continuously running uh, streaming jobs uh, this will land into the engine uh, in the near future it's on our roadmap and we are actively working on it uh, streaming scenarios uh, are uh, are very much used uh, into synapse tool today so uh, yeah we are, we are working on it to have like a long running spark job definitions for sure cool. from the from the outside Kind of open source Sparky route. It's very much a box which is being designed to fail occasion. It's it's going to break. But it does. Um, that's why it writes the checkpoints down. It why you know you have the separation of structured states from the actual compute, assuming that occasionally it's going to break. Your cluster is going to fall over because it's all about building on fallible hardware, right? So you spin it up, you carry on. 
the exact pattern about how you implement that in the internet. Yeah, love to see. Um, but certainly it's a it's a known thing that you don't want to leave a Spark cluster running for a month streaming things, two months, a year. You kind of expect it to bounce a couple of times. Well, yeah, well, on top of on top of what Simon said, I think uh, all kind of streaming scenarios, they are mostly about correctly aligning the requirements, right? So most people consider that they really, really need near real time things, uh, you know, requirements on the, on their scenario. Much, most of the times it's not that much so. Uh, maybe they are better suited if they are actually running a streaming engine such as Kafka or Event Hubs or anything else, landing the data directly on top of the data lake storage and then using Spark with the methodologies that Simon talked about to actually move those into the the you know the data lake tiers like bronze and and silver or not because sometimes there is a disconnection between the requirement of the you know of the scenario and what the technology can actually uh, do. Running a Spark job forever gets expensive, <laughs> and so you really need to pinpoint that. Do, do, does my scenario really, really need my job to run 24 7? And uh, those things usually justify when you actually have like an engine doing machine learning and you're presenting that result dynamically back out of Spark. Not all people need that such an advanced scenario, I would say that. Yeah. We have a uh... Question coming coming from Twitter says, just out of curiosity, uh, do you have a real world use case for C sharp and Spark? Anybody want to answer that? I I will I will take it. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <laughs> <clears throat> So C sharp is just like uh, any other language. We wanted to create a C sharp library for Spark so that uh, you can actually, for those who are more familiar with our C sharp ecosystem of developers, that they don't have to go and learn Python or other languages. They're able to use C sharp language to actually use Spark too <clears throat> for the distributed nature of everything that we do in Spark. So we wanted to create an additional language surface so that we can actually kind of bridge the learning gaps uh, for other users, uh, especially in the Microsoft development ecosystem. Pretty much what it is. I, I wouldn't say there's actually a particular use case. It's uh, more of a comfort. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, kind of, it's kind of building a new use case. Right? Because in terms of the, the Spark ecosystem, I mean, people using Spark, they don't they don't write C-sharp natively. They, they write Scala, Java, Python, R, SQL, um, but building a new C sharp kind of uh, interface brings in more people who couldn't previously access it, and actually exposes the same system to a wider set of people. So it's it's always an argument: do you build it because there's someone shouting and they have a use case, or do you build it to access a whole audience of people who might not have considered it previously because it wasn't in their language? And yeah, there's validity on both sides. Yeah, and it's a good point because when you think about um, <clears throat> the ANSI SQL that's provided in, C in Spark as well. We have a lot of Microsoft uh, you know, ecosystem uh, customers who are more comfortable with T-SQL. And so we actually have SQL serverless kind of as our serving layer for Spark so that those who are comfortable with using T-SQL can also use T-SQL. So just expanding the language surface so that we don't have to, um, every company doesn't have to retool their uh, existing, I guess, skill sets of their um, staff to be able to use Spark, and they can just use the knowledge that they have. Although everyone should just write Python. That's a very biased answer. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Simon and Martin. Uh, another one from Twitter. Uh, can you confirm? I think I might have heard this answer just now. Can you confirm that Delta tables created by Spark tools are able to be queried directly from Synapse serverless? Martin, did you just answer this a little bit in your answer? Sorry, say that again. So Delta tables created in Spark being being able to be read by SQL serverless, right? Yes. Yeah. I believe we do have 
Um, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to, trying to see what we have today published. Um, I know that we can read CSV and Parquet files. Um, I'm not sure if Delta is necessarily fully supported yet. I think there was an initiative to, to get that out there. I'll have to confirm uh, because I'm not really uh, focused on the SQL serverless side of things, but I can confirm that. I can hop in there. <laughs> I have to do it from the from the outside in terms of what we can currently do. Um, there's there's two different ways we can access uh, tables we got from Spark. So the if you register a Delta table with the Metastore with the with the Lake database inside of Spark, uh, if that's a Delta table, it's currently not replicated over to the uh, serverless side. So you can't query tables that you've SQL objects that you've created inside Spark over a Delta table. You can't query that through service, but you can 100% write an open row set statement in um, SQL serverless as a view over a Delta table. So we spend, a, we, we do it quite a lot using serverless to expose Delta tables. It just gets very confusing because it's called a table and you have this object that's a SQL table and it's over a Delta table and it depends what we're talking about. But absolutely as a pattern, quite often we wrap Delta tables in the lake with a serverless view using open row set from Delta with all the performance gains that you get from serverless. And we use that as a serving layer. It's just a kind of a metadata layer. It's just if you're trying to do it through the Spark Hive and having that replicate over, that's the only bit that doesn't work currently from Delta. Currently, based on what I can see. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, looks like the question queue is a little empty. So folks on the attendee side, uh, and ask some more stuff for the, our experts here. I am going to hand it back to Simon and just ask um, uh, if you'd like to demo something cool. You did say you have your demo environment stood up. Uh, so <laughs> something you can see what I've got. I know, right? Yeah. We, uh, we could certainly do something. So I had, I just had some real basics that I didn't think people are going to be asking about. Um, so, ah, oh, my Spark session stopped. Give me a moment while my Spark session, session starts. <laughs> but what we can do is we can quickly create a Delta table. Uh, we can set some stuff into it, and then we'll create a serverless view wrapped around it and expose it to Delta just to prove that that all works. If that makes sense. Give me two minutes while I cluster starts up, and I can run through that quite quickly. And then, uh, yeah, we'll see what the questions can be. I knew I should have had some Jeopardy music queued up here. <laughs> Session was started at the start of this. <laughs> I don't I'm 20 minutes time <laughs> There was a question um, on the community side, which I can um, take a crack at. I know it's kind of published, but um, someone asked just, are we monitoring? Are we kind of policing uh, how often folks are posting based on their uh, Synapse influencer level, and the short answer is no. We think it's all goodness whenever you share Synapse content, uh, tagging it with Azure Synapse or Synapse influencers, preferably both. Um, the uh, there's no kind of policing of that. Uh, I will say, and maybe breaking a little bit of news here, we are working on swag for the program, which will uh, be coming out probably in the next few weeks here um, and uh, will be focused on people who you know are sharing the most are um, really engaged and active in the program um, and will be surprising those folks with um, swag here and there which I'm super excited about um, so folks in this call you get to be the first to hear about that um, Simon how's the environment going you can start talking through the code while they. Uh... Cool. Right, so let's wipe forward. Uh, that should be synapse. All right. Yep. Just an excuse to use the flash transition. Um, sorry, wrong. <laughs> um, cool. Okay, so real basic, right? This is the my first Delta kind of thing. Um, I'm creating a database. So again, this is in you know, Spark. I've got my Spark pool set up. Yeah, and I've got my Spark pool on 3.2. But while it's actually starting, we can just go and have a check that that is there. You can see it's in there. Now, if we can click brand new, 
what size of cluster do I want? I'm being super cheap and going down to my nice small one. You've actually got 32 gigs, so ignore my 14 gig example earlier. You've actually got a lot more memory. Um, additional settings, you can see the default. And I do appreciate with the GA of uh, 3.2, that's now become the default. Oh, just as well, um, so we can see 3.2 is our default actually Spark version. And so important for me, you've got that 1.2 version of Delta Lake that's based in there. So if you're never not sure what's involved, and the question we had earlier in terms of how do we know which version of open source Spark and what's actually involved in it, you can go and see the versions of everything that's actually bundled into the version of the Spark pool that you're building. So I've got that. We have a 3.2 Spark cluster that's currently starting. Uh, if I run back to this, there we go. So I'm going to create a quick database. Again, this is a lake database. So this is created on the Spark side. This is just a load of metadata that allows you to create SQL references to things that live in the lake. Uh, and then we can run some stuff. So I'm going to go and run a quick create tables uh, state. Again, we've had people saying, how do I how do I transition into the world of Spark if I'm coming from SQL? Only it's like an alien language. It's all very, very different. And actually, if you want to, you can do everything in Spark SQL. And yeah, there's a couple of syntactical changes, but it's all very familiar. Creating a table and doing a lot of stuff. Yes, I've got strings. Don't have varchars because we're in a lake doing parquet, but it's essentially kind of some different data types and one or two slightly different syntax. That's going to create an empty table. So that is just a little shell. There's nothing in there. There's no data in there. That's just creating a transaction log, creating the basic bits and pieces. I've just got a real basic insert state. This is going to then go and as a separate thing, insert a load of data. Now all of Delta works on transactions. So actually what we can do is go and have a look at that table once it's built, which will live in my lake. So it's in the primary lake that's associated with the apps. I'm going to actually see some things and I'll see the parquet files because I've inserted data and I'll see some transaction files because the, the Delta lake there. So actually we can go and have a look through here. You should be able to see. In my primary lake that I'm using, various different things in here. Lake house, delta lake table, my addresses table, and then you can see I've got a parquet file. So by writing my delta table that just straight insert, insert SQL statements, it's just created a parquet file. All of delta is just parquet wrapped inside a transaction log. And then I've got two transactions. I've got one which is my create table statement and one which is my insert data statement. Can we open it from here? There we go. I can open it as JSON. Grab it over here. Let me just see if we get these kind of transaction logs. And that's the, one of the really nice bits of Delta is that the, the transaction log, which you normally assume is this horrible thing living in the background in some native application code, it's just some JSON files. We go and have a look. So, what happened as part of us inserting some data? Well, it added a file, it added the parquet file in there. We can see it's got stats like the number of records, which is great because if we ever do a SQL query saying select count star, it just reads that rather than actually having to count all the rows. It's got in inbuilt statistics that live next to the data. They could query this from different signups workspaces and they've actually got the stats to order the data. And we have these things, the minimum values, the maximum values are things that we can use for row skipping because we're now on Delta 1.2, which is great. So we get that. That's built into it. And again, we can just go read our data. We can have a play around. We can treat it like any other Delta table. Go and have a play, go and query it. It goes off, looks at the transaction log, says which parquet files are part of you, and then shows us the data from there. It's really, really straightforward, but that's that's the point, right? Delta is not this crazy, horrible, complex thing. It's just a different way of structuring the data on the disk, and it's exposed like any other bit of data. And then there's one final quick thing, which it's really hard because for people coming from a very SQL background, this is so obvious. I'm getting an insert statement and I'm doing a merge of this dummy bit of data into my table. And everyone's like, yeah, great. We can do that in SQL for years. In the world of Spark, that is magic. I mean, if you had to use Parquet, if you're just using straight Parquet or straight CSV, you'd need to read all the data up, edit it in memory, delete the data and write it back down again. And it was really, really painful. So Delta enables us to do that kind of thing is fantastic. And then again, we can go just make sure we should see an updated address, real, real basic example. There we go. 
I've got data address in there because it's gone and changed that transaction. Now we've got that location, so that lab lake house delta lake address. We can obviously try this, but again, we can just try this. So we can get rid of our create view. So straight select statement. Now I'm over in um, serverless. So this is a serverless SQL pool, writing a select statement using the open row set format. I'm just telling it it's a delta table. I not actually test this at all. Oh, it's not DB Lake. That doesn't exist. Uh, I need to get the other root of where that's called. If you give me a second, I can work out where that is. That's over there. The prepared demo. That's exactly how this works. Oh, give that a go. See if that can go and find our delta table and query. There we go. Uh, as easy as that. So there's a slight disjoint in that you need to create a view and point it at the place in the lake where you landed the data. That is it. And actually, a lot of the time, this kind of SQL, this creating of that view, you can even push that from Spark by writing a bit of code to work. But again, it's just data held in the lake, and you can query it from several different places. More and more things can plug into it. You can build a data factory where a synapse integration mapping data flow over it and query that delta data table. What's the in there? There we go. Quick demo. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, David's asking. I had noticed that you are using Apache as your Spark REST API job submission to management. This surprised me. I thought Apache I like Livy was a project that never launched. Is this going to reach V.1 under Microsoft? <laughs> Is this a question for Martin? Martin, you okay. Yeah. Yeah. I get all the tough ones, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, the question again, what was the question? I noticed that you're using Apache Livy, Livy as your Spark REST API job submission and management. This surprised me. I had thought Apache Livy was a project that never launched. It never even reached a V1.0 release. Is this going to reach V1 under Microsoft? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I don't think that we're making any significant improvements to Livy itself at this juncture. I mean, we do use it as a production system. Um, you know, I think that Perhaps I'll have to go back to the whole Livy Apache org and see if there's if it's just out of date or if it just needs to be updated. Um, but there's there's no additional necessary features that we need to add to Livy at, at this juncture uh, as far as what we're working on Synapse. Uh, we just use it as part of our job service. So um, it pretty much you know handles the the um, the execution of the job and just the the resiliency of the connections and things like that. So, um, yeah, I, we don't have anything to report on that uh, specifically for Livy. <laughs> um, Tough one. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a, a few questions um, come in from Twitter, uh, and we'll start with you, Martin, um, but then I'll, I'll open up to the group as well. Uh, basically, the differences um, between uh, open source Apache Spark, Synapse Spark, Databricks, and why would someone use one over another? Um, and just kind of talking through that. Okay, um, it's a good question. It's a good question. I think there's always, this question comes up quite often. Um, the best way I, can, that I, way I can answer this is, is that, uh, you know, for those who are kind of new to Spark, um, Spark is actually, uh, the open source project of Spark is actually owned by uh, Databricks, basically. I mean, they're the creators of Spark and they submit to open source. And of course, we have other committers on open source Spark, um, but they are pretty much the primary committers to that. So that's what you get from Databricks and open source. Now, open, Databricks has additional features that they don't necessarily publish out to uh, the open source Spark and some some internal things that they have um, that makes the, I guess, their their service a little bit uh, different. Um, from an uh, from our Synapse perspective of Spark, 
we do take the open source uh, of, of uh, Spark. And what we do is we also take from open source and we add little different flavors to our uh, uh, service offerings as well. As we mentioned before, you know, the whole, whole um, mission of uh, Synapse was to be able to make it very, very tightly integrated so that you can use your data warehouses and uh, the security and the platform with Spark and really create a more integrated solution so that it makes it a lot easier to use. Um, when we have we, when we have all of these things as separate services, it really takes a lot of effort for a customer to actually build this entire solution to actually work together. So our mission in the beginning was just a full integrated solution so we can get customers quickly to to solve their problems or actually build a solution. That was that was the in, initial case. Um, but with that, there's a lot of complexity that that we actually work on underneath the covers that actually sets us a little bit different. So we always talk about how we are a job service. We are serverless. We don't really really talk about cluster form. We are, um, you know, a, a pool based uh, system, um, although we may use the term cluster uh, interchangeably sometimes by mistake. <laughs> um, but that's kind of some of the differences that you would get from our Synapse offering. Now, what you see in Synapse today, uh, like I said, is kind of this whole integration of platform, you know, single pane of glass, you can do all of these things, but we're not, we're not completed. This is this, this version of Synapse that you see today is um, our like first step into that area. Well, we're gonna, we're actually working on a lot more improvements to this as well, so that we can actually converge a lot of this work together to make even, even easier than what you have today. Um, so that's what you gain from uh, using our uh, Azure Synapse is, is that we're tightly integrating and making a lot of um, our features much, much easier to use. Um, for instance, we have the uh, ADF integration uh, with, with our Synapse platform. We have our warehouse or um, uh, SQL uh, data warehouse or the, what is it, SQL pool. <laughs> and then of course we have the serverless SQL option as well on top of Spark. So we have all of these different engines and different ways of doing things. We're tightly integrating it so that uh, eventually we come to um, multiple engines being able to serve up the data that you store in your like. Anyone else want to jump in on that at all? Yeah, I'd like to add a bit of a nuance from not speaking for Microsoft, but from the outside. Uh, in addition to my role at Microsoft, I'm a member of the Apache Software Foundation, where the Apache Spark project is actually homed, right? And what you can think about with Spark is similar to, in some sense, to the SQL standardizations committee, right? In the olden days, people standardized languages and APIs and, and things like SQL in a standardizations committee, and then you had multiple vendors to choose from for your, for your actual implementation thereof. If you think about open source in that sense of the new version of a standardizations committee, right? The Apache Spark project produces new releases of Spark. We heard about Spark 3.2. And then there's multiple vendors that make that available to you in the context where it makes the most sense for that vendor, right? So our Spark is very good at working at the with the rest of the uh, Microsoft ecosystem. Other Sparks are good at working with other ecosystems, for instance, right? That's one of the differentiations. Uh, if you go to our competitors over at Amazon, their Spark is probably tuned to the sort of hardware they offer in their cloud. Ours is tuned to the sort of hardware we have in our cloud and so on, right? So I see this a strong parallel between standardizations committees of the past and the, com and the open source communities of today, right? In the Apache Spark community, we actually meet with the people from Databricks and from other vendors who, who ship Spark to decide on new APIs, new standards, new support for things. And then we all go off and, and make it available based on the shared code in the various platforms. Right? So there's a there's a commonality between the many sparks, but they differ where they are how they are integrated in the environment in which they actually run. Right? Ours works with the login that you already have, right? If you if you if you have a login in a different from a different vendor and not Active Directory, that's a bit tricky for us, but Active Directory is trickier for others. Right, so that those are the differences. Thanks so much. It's great perspective. 
Um, <clears throat> we have one more question here from David. Uh, can I add jars to my Spark cluster using Maven coordinates? Is there a way for Synapse to populate workspace packages from Maven coordinates? Is this a question for Marcus or? I know <laughs> I, <laughs> I know the answer in expectation where the answer will be yes at some point. I do not know whether that is the case today in the product. This is always difficult to know. Um, so the answer will be yes at some point. I, I don't know whether it is yes right now. That's a try it question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and there is a I way to try it. <laughs> yes, Sorry, Daniel. So, uh, so you can issue uh, within your notebook session. So you have uh, some kinds of library management within Synapse, right? So you have a workspace level, you have pool level, and then you have session level. So at session level, you can actually uh, issue a configure cell on top of your notebook. And you can pass along standard uh, you know, configuration commands uh, towards the Spark session. One of those configuration commands is actually load these libraries from Maven. Uh, it is not documented. Uh, I won't say that it is a supported scenario that we have uh, fully documented and tested within uh, uh, Synapse. So uh, you can definitely help, help definitely test it uh, how to do so. I can pass along a documentation link that covers this for a different Microsoft product that uh, used to support that methodology, and that, that for sure can be tested. And we, we would really appreciate your feedback and uh, what scenario you are trying to cover with this and how important that feature is to you. So we can bake it into the product moving forward. We're coming up to the top of the hour, so I want to thank Simon, Marcus, Daniel, and Martin for all of your great uh, discussion today and everyone else uh, who joined us and participated in the session. We had some great uh, discussion and answers, and hopefully that'll help uh, for those of you who are here to incorporate into your data and analytics work. Uh, we do have a short survey that we're going to pop into the chat now. Uh, really help us out if you could fill it out and uh, give us some feedback. Um, to tell us what you'd like to see in the future. We are continuing these Ask the Expert sessions every two weeks. Uh, and hot off the presses, I am excited to share the link for the next sign up. We're going to have the guys in a cube here. Um, Adam and Patrick are going to do some Synapse Essentials with us, probably even more demos than today. Um, and uh, excited to have them here, and hopefully you all can come back and join us for that. I just posted the yeah. form link in the chat to sign up. Um, if you haven't already done so, I'm sure you're all following us on at Azure underscore Synapse, um, tagging your Synapse related posts with Synapse influencers and yeah. Azure Synapse. Um, and then uh, if you have any questions related to the program at any time, we do have an email address. Uh, at synapseinfluencers at microsoft.com. Um, and thank you everyone again for joining today, and I hope to see you again in a couple weeks.